very pleased to now have our afternoon keynote from the Honorable James D. Rodriguez, Assistant Secretary of U.S. Department of Labor's Veterans Employment Training Service. He's an executive leader and proud veteran with over 30 years of experience in the U.S. government, corporate sector, and United States Marine Corps. <laughs> where he served for 21 years on active duty. His recent executive experience includes leadership roles at Deloitte and BAE Systems. He also previously serves as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Office of Warrior Care Policy, Office of Secretary of Defense from 2014 through 2017. Thank you very much. Let's welcome Assistant Secretary Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you. How's everybody doing? You know, it's funny when you come to corporate events and you're a government guy, right? You're like, do I keep the tie on? Do I take the tie off? You know, try to figure those things out, right? Fortunately, I've been a corporate guy, so I'm like, hey, anytime I get to get back around corporate people, I'm taking a tie off, right? <laughs> and so, uh, but hey, thanks for having me here. This is a great event. And what I wanted to do, spend a little bit of time talking about Department of Labor Veteran Employment Training Service. Who knows what DOL Vets actually does? And it's not a trick question. Who knows what we do? So that means I'm in the right place, right? And the reason I say that is because part of my job is to inform and educate people about the resources that we have at DOL Vets and how critical it is to the work you all do. What most people don't realize is that we are a federal agency responsible for employment of our nation's veterans, military spouses, and our transitioning service members, right? We obviously work very closely with our partners at DOD as part of the Transition Assistance Program. My career Deputy Assistant Secretary, she is on the TAP Executive Council. Everybody knows what TAP is, right? And I know, how many is military in here? Okay, thank you all for your service. So, I don't, so we're all used to acronyms, right? I'll try to get away from those acronyms as much as I can. But truthfully, TAP, right, is a three-day minimum, five-day maximum training tool designed to help transitioning service members, right? I know you all got some information uh, from my wonderful colleague at DOD this morning about TAP, but I'm going to give you a little bit of details what we talk about when it comes to Department of Labor and what we do to help those transitioning service members, if that's okay. One of the most important things we do is talk about the resources that we have that are spread across the entire country. But before I do that, I want to talk about one thing that is important. What is our VETS vision? This is our vision statement that I created when I came to office two years ago. It's to enable all transitioning service members, veterans, and military spouses to reach their full potential in the workplace. When I came two years ago, excuse me, when I came two years ago, military spouses wasn't part of the conversation. But their most important part of the conversation that we change because they are so integral to the overall well-being and transition of that service member who just happens to be married. But they're often left out of the conversation and the equation. How many of you all knew that military spouses have an unemployment rate equal to about 22 to 23 percent compared to the national average? Think about that. Highly educated military spouses, right, who are extremely well qualified, but extremely unemployed, right? 23 percent. When you look at the veterans, veterans are about 2.5% as of last, last month, 2.5% of the unemployment rate compared to 3.6% of the national average. One of the things that is often lost on people is that vets have a higher employability rate than any other category of people. I know you all in this room are employers, you know this, but what I think most people don't realize is that our vets outperform our non-veteran peers in every single category when it comes to employment men and women alike, all races, all age groups, every single one of them. But what most people don't realize is that the average veteran age that's in the employment arena right now is 47 years old. But what we always think about is these young men and women who are right out of the military, right out of that transition, right? They're the ones who are making that transition and those are the ones you see as a face of that transitioning veteran. But we have veterans in the workforce well past their 60s and they are highly employable. They're doing great things. They're outperforming their peers in every industry right now. Veterans get employed or uh, promoted at a higher rate. They stay longer in the organization, more so than their non-veteran peers. 
Not sure if you all knew this, but one of the things when I talk with organizational leaders about corporations also, they were talking about we want to hire these young college graduates. We don't often, the conversation had been about we're not hiring military spouses because they're transitioning, they're moving too much, right? Every two years, that conversation is null and void now because on average, on average, a 22-year-old college graduate will leave their first four jobs within their first four years, right? So how can we not say now that we can bring more spouses into the workforce, right? We just have to find innovative ways to bring them into the workforce, especially now in a hybrid environment. We know we can do that. We know we can do remote work as well. Who would have thought the federal government could go full-time remote and the country still operate, right? If you look at the workforce system, nobody would have ever thought that. But the light stayed on, right? People in the service industry were still working. Things still continued to operate. And the federal government was at a hybrid environment, right, in most cases. And we're still there. We're still kind of bringing ourselves out of this right now. And so when you talk about the impact that our veterans have made on the community, it's tremendous, but it's often lost on people. Our veterans right now are enrolled in college than any other demographic as well, all the way from age 22 to age 55. Why is that? GI Bill, right? What a beauty of being in the military and military service is GI Bill. But here's one of the other things that we knew this all along. Uh, man, we don't like to admit it, but women are smarter than us, right? We know this. I have a wife and two daughters, so I know this a long time ago, right? Women are enrolled in college at a more robust rate than men are, our male veterans. But yet when you look at, oftentimes, when you look at their pay gaps, right? Women are getting paid a lot less than men in every single category. Here's the other thing. Bureau of Labor Statistics says that women are in more senior management positions, women veterans that is, in more senior management positions than males. Who thought that would be the, the opposite? But it's true. When you look at statistics, women are in more senior management positions in organizations than males are, right? But not at the most, most senior management positions, not the CEOs, right? Not at the C-suite levels, things like that but they're in mid-level management, some senior level management. The reason that's important is because organizations, if you look at research, organizations do better when they have women leaders as part of their organizational team, right? Especially women veterans. I think that's something that we often lose track of. One of the things I wanna talk about is what we do at DOL Vets. We have approximately 2,800 people that by organization has within it right now. That's in contractors, that's permanent staff, uh, our grantees. Out of those 2,800 people, they're spread all across the entire country and on average 440,000 transitioning service members, veterans are touched by our programs every year, 440,000. We're at 200 installations across the country with our colleagues at DOD executing the TAP class, right? On top of that, I have six regional veteran employment coordinators. And their whole purpose in life is to work with organizations like you all to find veterans who are looking for employment in specific career fields. They have a lot of passion for doing the work because they're all veterans. 92% of my organization are veterans themselves. The rest of them are doing this work because they love doing the work and they've been around the veteran community some form or fashion. So we have six regional veteran employment coordinators spread out into, across the entire country, every state, Every state has a state director. All of them, except 14 of them, have an assistant state director. And their whole job is to ensure that the states are meeting requirements uh, set forth by companies to hire more veterans. So these are untapped resources that are often overlooked. Anybody heard for, of the, uh, the workforce, American workforce centers, American job centers, right? You guys all heard about that. You've all heard the term DVOP leavers, Disabled Veteran Outreach Program, Local Veteran Employment Resource uh, or roles. 1,500 of DVOPs and leavers are supported by my organization. 1,500 across the entire country. And their whole job is to work with those veterans who are at risk of being homeless, who have uh, significant barriers to employment, who are looking for employment, military spouses, at whatever level they need uh, at that local level, state level, and regional level. So we have the resources that are funded by the taxpayer. I always get in trouble for it. I say, we have these free resources for you, right? But it's not free, it's taxpayer funded, right? 
And so, but we are able to work with you all. So it's you, it's free to you to utilize the resources that we have. But oftentimes our state directors, our regional directors are, um, are underutilized. They're going to get mad for me for saying that, but because they work tremendous amount. But when I say underutilized, I'm talking about as far as partnerships and, and uh, relationships with organizations that are looking to hire more veterans, right? Extremely uh, well-versed in this. Most of our regional leaders, our state directors have been in the workforce system of some fashion for numerous amount of years before they ever get into any of those roles. One of the things I also want to talk about is our homeless veteran reintegration program. Has anybody ever heard of that? Lisa? Lisa's smart. She knows everything. So I'm always going to just ask Lisa, right? So she makes me look good. Uh, homeless veteran reintegration program. On average, we give about $58 million to organizations that help support our veterans who are at risk of becoming homeless or who are homeless themselves in partnership with our colleagues at the Department of Veterans Affairs. They get them housed, they get them health care, they get them uh, well, if you will, and then we get them employed. One of the things that we also focus on is that ensuring that they have employment uh, opportunities, if you will, that allow them to have a career as, also, as well, right? On average, depending on the state, there are $15 in some of the, the um, some of the states, $15 is starting average uh, salary, but other, on uh, uh, some other states, about $35 an hour. So they have to be based off of federal mandates. They have to be above $15 an hour. And I could give you numerous stories about how our programs have changed lives. I just had a text from a friend of mine out in uh, Arkansas, and he was talking about our program that I just mentioned. The, the American Job Center, a veteran who was homeless at the time, had numerous amount of skills, but moved back to Arkansas and didn't have any connections there uh, when it came to finding the right type of employment and was homeless living out of his car. And he went to the American Job Center, used the resources there, and now has started off a new job making uh, $60,000 a year. Now, depending on where you're at, $60,000 may not be a lot of money, right? But fortunately for him in Arkansas, starting off at $60,000 is good. Right. But here's what I if you all just remember what I just said, though. Right. He's not going to stay in that role long. I can guarantee you that because veterans on average get promoted faster than their non-veteran peers. And that's what's going to happen. So you had to have a foot in the door. And that's where our American job centers, our DevOps and Levers came into play. This happens all the time around the country. But most people don't realize that this is the work that's being conducted at Department of Labor. One of the other things that most people don't realize is that there is a high percentage of our veterans and military families that are in what we call a food insecurity posture. Do you all realize that? What does that mean? They're not making enough money to really be above a standard living wage, and so they are on subsidized, um, subsidized income right, from the federal government. And this is why I always talk about military spouses, because if that military spouse loses his or her employment, what does that do to the family? Right. It creates a void in that financial uh, posture of that family. Right. One of the things we're working on the Department of Labor is protecting that military spouse rights to employment. We focus on working with the Guard Reserve. One of the things we want to do is figure out ways to work with industry, figure out ways within government to help protect military spouse employment rights. And so that's one of the things that our team has consistently been focused on since last year. One of the other things we do is. We have the Hire Vets Medallion Program. I know Vets Index, and how many of you all are Vets Index awardees, grantees, or awardees, rather? Raise your hands, it's okay. Right. Good for you all, right? Because it's important to get recognized for the work you all do. But one of the things that often gets overlooked is not only the employment of veterans and military spouses, it's the retention of those veterans and military spouses, right? People often forget about that in the conversation. And when I was in industry, that was one of the things that I focused on was the retention. Because how many of you all know how much money it costs to hire someone? Everybody's hands should come up, right? Everybody knows what the cost is to hire someone. So it's better to rebuild out programs that allow you to retain those individuals, correct? I mean, it's kind of common business sense. And so if you are aware of the fact that veterans are going to stay longer, why would you not want to hire more veterans? And so... One of the things that I talk to corporate leaders oftentimes about is that we are having 
veterans come into your industries, which is great. But what we also need is veterans at the management and the executive levels also, right? We need veterans at those levels because that's where, one of the things that we are here is if I see it, that means I can become it, right? And so when organizations are doing great things with regards to hiring veterans, having veterans that ascend into those levels of leadership allow them to have a broader approach and a broader perspective on how your program should be expanded. I hear this from companies often, is that our veterans program is successful. We're doing such a great job, but I need to reduce some of my recruitment efforts because they're gonna to continue to maintain themselves. And so I'll take away uh, some of the resources for those veteran programs because they're gonna to continue to sustain, they're gonna to continue to grow. And I always tell uh, corporate leaders, that's the worst thing you can do. Veterans are good for business. If you look at every part of pieces of data, veterans are good for your business. So why would you wanna take something away that's good for business? On top of that, look for where your strategic partners are. One of the things we do at Labor is we work with union leaders. We work with unions of all sorts. We work with nonprofits. We work with our federal government partners. I sit on two interagency committees, one of those being on mental health. One of the biggest challenges, and some of you all within, in this room know this, right? One of the biggest challenges that veterans have is that mental transition also. So what we are doing within the federal government right now is we have an interagency task force on awareness of mental health issues for transitioning veterans. That has to go hand in hand with that physical transition as well. Because every one of you who raised your hand when I asked you if you're veterans, whether you're gonna admit it or not, right? There was a sense of challenge when you transition, correct? Physical and or mental. And a lot of times what we forget about is that mental transition affects that physical transition and vice versa. So we have to figure out ways to make sure that our organizations that we are part of understand that. So they create that culture that is welcoming, but also where the veterans want to land. That is one of the biggest things that often gets uh, kind of misscrewed, if you will, is that, misconstrued, if you will, is that uh, organizations talk about they want to hire veterans, hire veterans, but yet there's not a culture that is receptive of those veterans. There's a, there's a saying, some of you may have heard this, is that people leave managers, they don't leave organizations, right? That is true across every industry because oftentimes the managers are not educated enough on how to ensure that that veteran is successful when they come into the organization. And so it's kind of the same thing in the military. When uh, I was speaking to all the most senior enlisted leaders at the Pentagon, senior enlisted leaders of the Department of Defense, and I was talking to them about transition and uh, they were talking about what are, you know, some of the challenges of it. They knew from their perspective, and then I was talking to them from about a labor perspective. And then they asked me, uh, I've been retired 14 years, and they asked me, what do, uh, what do you think was something you would have liked to know more about when you're transitioning out? And I said, taxes. <laughs> and everybody kind of does exactly what you did, taxes, right? I said, these are things that are important to your life. But that young 22-year-old, who's been getting paid their entire life, right? Have not had to worry about taxes, have been tax exempt for many things. And somebody who did a 30 year or 20 year career have been tax, ex tax exempt for many things. When I first retired, I retired in Virginia. About a month later, I got a couple of thousand dollar tax bill that I had never paid before because I had to pay property taxes on my cars because I was a Texas resident, right? And so think about that. Think about that young 22 year old that's transitioned out of military. Not to mention, when they're going back to economies that may be a little bit more depressed than uh, some of the other places where they've been stationed, there's going to be financial implications there too, right? On top of the fact that they may have some challenges in finding the right foot in the door, right um, landing spot when it comes to uh, the right organizations. This is where we come in. We have these resources that I just mentioned at the American Job Centers. We have regional veteran employment coordinators. We have our DVOPs. We have our levers that can help with that. Not to mention we have partners all over the country that are in all of the, the, uh, the different categories that I mentioned earlier. And so ensuring that we exist to support you all is something that I always try to make sure that everyone understands that our job as a federal government, you never want to use that, that phrase, I'm from the federal government and we're here to help. Right? <laughs> as soon as you say that, right, everybody's like, closes the door, you know. But in reality, that's what we do. In reality, that's what we do. 
we have the resources that are taxpayer funded to help you all when you're looking for specific types of individuals. Here's one of the things I want to tell you a story real quick, if I can. One of the things that is often a uh, topic of discussion is I served in the combat arms, right? I was an infantryman. I was, you know, an artillery guy. Was, I've been in combat arms too, right? But I can't take my experience and put that on a resume and land a corporate job. That's what people say, right? Now, let me give you a story about how we have to change the mindset of that for the individual as well as the corporations. There's a young man, his name was uh, Sergeant Reeves, Staff Sergeant Reeves, I'm sorry, but get mad at me for demoting him. He was Army, Army sniper, Army recruiter of the year, had been in Iraq, the first parts of Iraq. Got out of the military because of medical discharge. I had been out, I'd been retired already about a year, and I was working at a big defense and aerospace company, and we were building out a program up in Nashville, New Hampshire. And uh, I talked to Reeves. I just happened to be back in San Diego. He was at the hospital because he was out of the military, was at the hospital because that's where he had transitioned out of the Balboa Naval Medical Center for those who have been in San Diego. And um, I asked him, what is he doing? And he was like, nothing. So, what type of job are you looking for? He's like, I don't know where to go. I'm an Army sniper. I don't know what type of job to look for. Nobody wants an Army sniper in their roles. I said, well, I beg to differ, right? I said, do you actually understand how to plan, right? You know what risk is. You know how time management. So I went through all these different things that somebody in his type of experience would have. I brought that back to our company, our company in New Hampshire at the time. And we were building weapon systems, a defense and aerospace company. They were building weapon systems, but they have a branch in there that was all focused on optics, right? Working on optics, different gyroscopes, different depth perceptions, all kinds of different things. And I said, this is a perfect spot for him. We put him in that job. I hired him, put him in that job. Three months later, he was working on, and I can't even tell you what it was, <laughs> but it was an optics that went on a, a naval weapons, uh, put it on a naval weapons set, to put it that way. And the reason I say I can't tell you what it is because it was a classified thing. Anyway, he was working on his weapon system, right? Fast forward three years later. Now, keep in mind, Staff Sergeant Reeves didn't have a college degree, right? Three years, three months before that, he was completely unemployed, uh, had a wife and two kids, but sitting at home trying to figure out what he's going to do with his life. Fast forward three years later, he's a patent holder on three inventions, right, to help build out brand new types of optics for the company. So patent holder, right, on three types of different optics that the company had not looked at on how to improve. Because what was happening is, I got the backstory, they were sending these systems over, they were getting affected by the desert sand, and they were breaking at a more cyclic rate than they anticipated. He figured out a way to make them last longer through new processes, new type of glass, all kinds of other stuff, right? Bottom line is, he took his skill sets and put them to use in this company because he was embedded in his organization, figured out how the organization operated, and knew what they needed. And he's still working for the company today. And on top of that, as I mentioned, I think he's actually was working on two more patents. So this is a type of... This is the type of initiative that veterans take when they get into organization. You all know this. You all have done this yourself because that's why you're here, right? How many of you plan to actually be wearing a suit when you got out of the military and coming into these conferences in New York? But what happens is natural progression happens, right? Just like you did in the military. I always tell everybody, when you joined the military, you didn't plan on staying in a private the entire time or a lieutenant the entire time, did you? You figured out ways to get promoted you figured out what you needed to do to make sure that you were successful throughout your career, whether it's four years, 20 years. The same thing happens given the right opportunity and the right organization when you get out of the military. And you have to take advantage of that. But oftentimes we don't. Oftentimes we wait for somebody to tell us what we need to do versus vice us taking action on it. And so I always try to convey this to veterans. Um, we were just talking about this uh, briefly, Eddie, and I were just talking about this, about the imposter syndrome. I was speaking to Student Veterans of America, their national leaders uh, in December, I think it was, in Washington, D.C., their, their conference. I was closing out the conference, and uh, I went there, and I asked, and I'll ask this audience, too, how many of you all have imposter syndrome? And again, that's not a pop question. Put your hands up. It's okay, right? right? I, was, I asked them all that, and out of all these 
great leaders across the country, had served in the military, Iraq, Afghanistan, all kinds of different places, had been educated, were now leaders of, in the university, student veterans of America, doing all kinds of amazing things. Every, almost every one of their hands came up and they, uh, because they all said they had imposter syndrome. You know what I told them? Get over that crap, right? Because you put the work in, right? Just like you all, you all put the work in. You put the uniform on first place and you got educated. You found your way into conversations that mattered and you're the one to put the work in and that's why you're here today. Don't never diminish the fact that you put the work in. And when, as long as you can do that, then you have a different mentality when it comes to change. Like I told him when I was at this uh, conference, I said, I tell you what, I don't have imposter syndrome. And the reason being, not because I'm arrogant, the reason being is because I know how much work I put into getting to where I am today, but at the same time, but not never fail to recognize the people to help me get here. Right? Most importantly, family, first and foremost. But second, all of my friends and colleagues, some of them who are in this room today that I've known forever. And so the thing to recognize is the fact that there are resources that exist to support our veterans. DOL vets, all of the other friends and colleagues that are in this room, all the nonprofits that put forth a lot of work and are underpaid, right? All these things exist to help our fellow veterans and our military spouses and their families. And so what I would encourage you all to do is think outside the box. Think how organizations can work more collaboratively together. Think about how we as a government agency can also be more collaborative with the work that you are doing with our programs because our programs only exist when we have our veterans who are benefiting from it, right? We can do so much work unless our veterans are benefiting from it, it doesn't matter. And so this is what I tell my team all the time. How do we look at ourselves and how do we, this is a phrase that, that uh, is out there, a lot of you have heard this, but how can we be better today than we were yesterday? And when we come to work with that attitude, then we know that we're here to support our veterans. All of our programs exist to support them, but we are here at the end of the day to support the veterans, military families, and their spouses to ensure that they have the resources and the capability to land on their feet when they make that transition out of the military. So with that, I've got about six more pages of talking points. That's okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. What I wanted to do was leave it open to questions uh, because of the fact that to me, anytime you get someone up here uh, and you don't often get a chance to ask questions of what I do, uh, I want to make sure I always leave opportunity for questions, if that's okay. All right. Yes, sir. Well, first, thanks for your service. You know, and you. I appreciate what you continue to do after service and giving back to our community. You know, much applause to you. You definitely deserve it. You're leading by example. So thank, thank you. you. Um, second, so we sit in the, in the veteran space, and I think one of the things that I've, I've noticed in Verizon, I'll use Verizon because that's where I'm at, right, is the protective veteran class, right? I, I think there needs to be more emphasis being pushed through that. I'm constantly educating recruiters on, you know, a veteran's preference, protective veteran status, being able to skip first in, first out, being able to utilize that and, and activate that better. Um, you know, it's always an upward push, right? We know that it's a mandate from EEO and that's something we have to comply with. But I think there could be a lot more hiring in this space if we had some pressure coming out from the government saying, hey, you know, like, let's focus, let's refocus on it. Because the Vietnam veterans really hooked us up as veterans, right? right. I mean, I, we, we got to be grateful as veterans yeah. that, you know, unfortunately they went through the challenges that they had finding job opportunities. And so re reigniting that, that veterans preference, I think is a, is a huge opportunity for us as a, as a community. And then I think extending that if possible, when we get to a point where we're, we're allowing military spouses, if that becomes such, continues to be such a problem for employment, any comments on, on both of those? Yeah, so thanks for that. So yeah. what are the things that it's, this is a topic of conversation quite a bit, is that veterans preference, right? And so in federal government, we could do that. So in federal government, obviously you can get veterans preference. And truthfully, veterans with 30% or greater service-connected disability work more predominantly in federal government than they do in the corporate industry. And the higher your, your disability rating, the less likely you are to be em employed. Do you all know that? 60% or greater, you're even more or less likely to be employed. And why is that? Think about it. There's a lot of things that go into that uh, equation, but a lot of it is the mental and physical health transition, right? Understanding that you still have a lot to contribute when you get out of the military, but we have to find the right niche for organizations 
or to be receptive of those individuals with those service connections. But as a federal government, this really takes a lot of work uh, from our congressional leaders, right? Because they're the ones who enact this legislation, enact these laws. And so one of the things that you have to take into account is also what is the needs of the corporate sector too? And are we uh, distinguishing between our veteran protected class versus the other classes, things like that? So that's something that's constant part of the, the uh, conversation. But what we always try to do is, is again, whether you're a veteran with a service connected disability or just a disability in general, right? The value that that veteran brings to the workplace should trump having to have a protected class status. And so this is what uh, we're constantly having conversations about, but it does require legislation, unfortunately, for that to actually occur. Thank you, Russ. So okay. in speaking about imposter syndrome, yep. that being when you, your competence is much higher than your confidence, right? And the, one of the major ways to build confidence is to have pride in your knowledge base. What does the DOL do to prepare transitioning service members to build their own pride in their soft or hard skill base. So that way, when they arrive in a transition to a civilian sector, they have less of yeah. an imposter syndrome. Well, that's a good question, right? How many people realize you don't have to be the hardest, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room, right? I can tell you that I'm not the smartest person on my team by far, right? I've got some amazing people that work with me and my organization. But a smart person does recognize the fact that they bring smarter people in to help them become successful, right? And I think that's what I really try to do is bring people in to help me be successful that I know are subject matter experts. I don't have to be a subject matter expert in everything, but I do have to know where those resources exist, right? How can I get the answer? So part of the TAP program, if you all, some of you all gone through TAP, some of you may not, you may have retired or got out before that, but that curriculum is constantly being developed. And so that's why we have a TAP Executive Council that exists to help with that. And some of the feedback we get through surveys are how can we help prepare the individual? One of the things that we have now is called Employment Navigator Partnership Pilot. We've been doing this pilot for the last two years. And, uh, and I was actually supposed to talk about this earlier, so thanks for reminding me. Uh, so we have this Employment Navigator Partnership Pilot. And it basically is, it's now an individual counseling session between that transitioning service member. Somebody goes through TAP, and it's in the pilot stage, so it's only on 20 installations right now. And so they go through TAP, but they get in touch with this EMPP or Employment Navigator, we call them, an EN. And then he or she can help them understand what their skill sets are. They can start preparing them on an individual basis through counseling sessions to go into whatever industry they want. Our partners exist all across the entire country. Somebody wants to go into the construction industry. We can connect them from California to the construction industry, helmet to hard hats in New Jersey. Right. Every single industry from IT to cyber, you name it, we have those relationships and partnerships. And so now that in itself is infusing a little bit of confidence because now I have a little bit more handle on my transition. And so going back to the insecurity piece of it, just like when you joined the military, right? How many of you knew right away where the, the chow hall was? You found your way to the chow hall, though, right? Because you had to find uh directions or somebody showed you just like they showed you how to do your job right you went to the school somebody showed you there it's the exact same thing you have to be able to, to find those resources to help you become successful and this is where that confidence piece comes in there right and the confidence comes with having a good solid grasp on what you want to do that's probably the biggest thing that uh, veterans have with regards to challenges when they're getting out of military is what do i want to do when i'm transitioning now right but a lot of that preparation has to come way before you're actually out the door. It has to come in that process of that decision making, right? When are you deciding, maybe I'm gonna get out, maybe I'm not. Well, even if you're not gonna get out, still go to the TAP class because you'll learn something from there, right? And this is what we're trying to do is get them to go to TAP earlier so that way they can make an informed decision when they're getting out. So hopefully that answers some of your questions. Okay, thank you. James, this, is, yeah. this might be an interagency type of question, but I'd like to get your thought leadership between the DOL and the DOD relevant to SkillBridge, yep. specific to what I am seeing in the space as a practitioner. Uh, last several years, I've helped the United Health Group uh, DOD SkillBridge program get off the ground. And I'll wave the flag around. We've pushed 300 through that program. Phenomenal opportunities. But what kept me up at night was over 2,000 didn't get into our program. Mm -hmm. And that kind of speaks to 
the downward pressure of service members not getting the opportunities relevant to the timeline of an ETS. So I wonder, it's some of the things that have been thrown out there around the idea of, could we extend SkillBridge? Because there are some services, and I think might have been you, Mike, or someone said that the Navy is shortening their time on SkillBridge. I believe that's happening the case. And when I first saw that, I just kind of lost my mind a little bit. So we're limiting opportunities for service members relevant to extending the opportunities by a better policy. Right. So when I think yeah. about this, the better cooperation from the practitioner side is to be able to extend SkillBridge in such a way that an ETS no longer matters. In other words, how do we influence the military and the, the establishment, the DOL and DODs of the world, key decision makers? They're going to say, you know what, instead of having commanders decide that you're only going to get 30 days, 90 days. Maybe, maybe we go back to 180 days and then maybe extend the policy past the ETS time. How do we better cooperate to, great, to, to, to create a broader opportunity? I don't know if you have any thought leadership on that or someone from the DOD might want to comment on that. Yeah, I'll give you some thoughts, right? In the DOD Skill Bridge, everybody's familiar with DOD Skill Bridge, right? It's a great program uh, and it is a DOD program. And so what we do see as far as data and uh, Forgive me, my numbers are not 100% accurate, but about 16,000 plus go through DOD Skill Bridge uh, every year, right? Considering 180 to 200,000 transition out of the military. So we know those 16,000 are benefiting from that. I don't have the data on with their, how long they're in the Skill Bridge program. But one of the things to remember is that DOD has a singular mission, first and foremost, right? It's the defense of this country. And so that's the, the challenge, right? Because they also look at readiness too. How do they maintain readiness and how do they also allow people to transition out? I'm an advocate for skill bridge program. I'm a big believer in it. We partner in it, but we also have to look beyond that too. What are we doing as far as helping set those service members up who did not get to participate in skill bridge when they step out the door of DOD? And so these are some of the things we're working on. Registered apprenticeship programs, Department of Labor registered apprenticeship program. Anybody familiar with that? It's a certifiable registered apprenticeship program as I mentioned, I'm gonna keep calling on Lisa because she, she knows everything so open it. She makes me look good, good. So the registered apprenticeship program, when a service member or a veteran goes through a registered apprenticeship program, on average, they're making $72,000, $74,000 a year as soon as they complete that registered apprenticeship program without any debt for college, right? So registered apprenticeship programs are the future. We talk, they call it the, uh, the future, um, forget the phrase I was going to use. Uh, but anyway, registered apprenticeship programs are where we're looking at as a nation to try to get more people in industries all across the board, white collar, blue collar industries, because there's a gap in replacements of people who are retiring out with those special skill sets. And so we're looking at ways on how to expand registered apprenticeship programs, work with our colleagues at DOL. So we have to get beyond just what DOD is doing. I know everybody talks about that. Can we get longer at DOD, right? Can we get them longer? And, and truthfully, DOD would do it if it didn't affect their mission. But DOD has a, spe a specific and unique mission, uh, and we have to be cognizant of that too. But we also have to look at innovative ways to make sure that they also get opportunities to participate in something that's similar to it when they do separate. If, how many of you went to college right away when you, graduated, when you got out of military, right? Like it took me 17 years to, go, to finish my degree because I was on active duty while I was going to college, and I went to six different universities, but I didn't want to go to college when I first retired. Eventually, a couple years later, I went to graduate school. And then, but there's so many veterans that don't want to do that. And so if we want them to be well positioned for uh, high earning jobs, right? Sustainable generational growth in their uh, career fields, apprenticeship programs, we have to look at that. And so this is what we're trying to do to help supplement what's happening or not happening within DOD. But we work very closely with our colleagues at DOD. Yes, sir. Hey, how you doing? Uh, my name is Miles with United Airlines. Want to first and foremost thank you and everyone here for your service. Um, my question to you is this: We're building out our, our United Airlines. in two verticals: education and now with United Airlines. Um, I noticed that most of these big corporations they're looking to bring in more veterans, but the problem is they don't necessarily know how to bring them in. Would you recommend, for example, we at a university, for example, Colorado Tech, 
or take an MOS training, reading transcripts, how to actually, like you mentioned earlier, convert that experience into actual paper and what you can apply it to as far as experience is concerned. Would you recommend some of these co companies or corporations to start looking at maybe some possibly MLS training aside from hiring veterans to, to recruit veterans? Or um, is there anything else that you could suggest to these organizations? So good question. I know if you probably went around, you went around a room and you ask everybody what they do to bring in veterans, everybody's gonna have a, a different slash sometimes similar approach to this, right? Everybody has, if you all remember years ago, MOS translators was a big thing, right? Everybody was doing MOS translators and then we realized, you know, maybe that's not the best way for us to go. And so we started all kinds of other programs to ensure that we understood what that veteran skill set were when they were transitioning out of military, right? If you look at, and, and what do we all say when you're getting out of the military? What did you do in the, in the military? Well, that's a whole lot of things. So we have to look beyond just the MOS, right? Mm -hmm. I had five MOSs in my 21 years. I, and I don't even know if any of them qualify for me to be on the stage today. Right? <laughs> but, but, but truthfully, right, when you, take, when, you, uh, when you take all of that experience into account, how do you conceptualize that? How do you frame it? How does the organization that's receiving that, how do they understand what you bring to the table is the important piece of that. And there's numerous ways to do that, so I can't give you one specific example. Mm -hmm. But I do know that is important because not all veterans want to go into their same type of role when they're leaving, right? right. But specifically, a lot of mechanics I want to go into mechanic roles because that's kind of their mental uh, comfort zone, if you will, right? That's what they know. But other people don't, right? And so one of the challenges that you have, again, going back to what I said earlier, is people still don't know what they want to do when they get out of the military. And so having to have conversations with them to understand where their skill sets are going to be needed the most in careers that need them. One of the things I was talking with a corporate uh, banking industry uh, leader about not too long ago was – they're hiring veterans, enlisted veterans, into their risk practice in their bank mm -hmm. because they understood that veterans knew how to manage risk, right? And from an operational standpoint, and they felt that they could bring veterans in there. And after they brought these veterans in, they realized they couldn't hire enough of them without college degrees. They took away that college degree requirement, and now they're uh, bringing more veterans into their risk category. So again, looking beyond just the MOSs, looking at what resources exist to help those translations. One of the things that we also have at VETS is called off-base transition training. It's a new program that was two years ago we put in place. It's at five states right now, Texas, California, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. And what we do is we work with veterans who, regardless of how long they've been out, they can come and take refresher training. All the things that you've got taught in TAP, they can actually take again as a veteran. Again, another resource that helps them build out their resume, helps them get connected to employers. So these resources do exist. So what I would encourage you all to do when you leave here, Google DOL Vets, right? And you get to see all the programs that we have that all of them that I just spoke about today, not to mention our higher Vets Medallion program that's similar to uh, the Vets Index program where we recognize employers. Many of them are in this room today. USA is one of our consistent higher Vets Medallion programs, JP Morgan, uh, companies like that. They get a federally recognized uh, medallion, if you will, that shows that they are veteran ready, veteran friendly, and uh, they retain veterans because there's specific federal requirements they have to meet. But they get recognized. One of the things that, uh, and I know you need me to get off, but I'm going to do this real quick. <laughs> but one of the things that also happens is you get, once you're an award winner, you get on our website free, right? And when vets go through the chat class, if they want to go to North Carolina, they can look on North Carolina's piece, their state, and see what employers who have won that award exist and then they can go directly to your careers page so if you've not applied for that i encourage you all to do that the actual april 30th is our closeout and then we'll last year 800 plus uh companies received the higher vestment down award secretary level award that's administered by my office and so i would encourage you all to do that because again there's so much information out there but narrowing down that information is the most relevant to that individual that's transitioning is what's the most important Understand why I appreciate it. Just a cheap plug. Actually, not even a cheap plug. I do want to be say I'm very proud of our United for Veterans BRG. We have 3,000 members, and we were just with uh, we talked about Veteran Index. Just uh, as of today, we're announcing three star rating from them as well. So that's amazing, y'all. Once again, thank you. Hey, well, listen, thank you all again. Appreciate it.